So we have more general continued fraction expansions here. Um, and so I have this, this kind of bolded equation right here. It's a, it's a, or an expression, more, uh, more generally, I suppose. So we have a0 plus b1 over a1 plus b2 over a2 plus b3 over. So basically, again, it's a nested fraction structure, but these, we're adding this other sequence of b values, which need not equal 1, basically. Uh, everything we've seen up till, up until now, uh, have had 1s as the numerators of these continued fractions, but it turns out it can be more general, and we can still make sense of it, and we can get some some amazing results, as I just presented in the, uh, in the intro. In the intro. So, right. Here's one first thing that we should consider, um, and I'm going to move on, I'm actually going to go to this document here, which is the chapter of the textbook. Uh, let me see if I can go up to the top to show you which, um, which book it's from. So it's chapter 7, and it's presenting these, these brilliant kind of formulas. Hmm. Alright, so perhaps it doesn't have the author's name here. Where, where would it be? Certainly, I'll put a link in the description for where you can find this textbook and some other chapters from the textbook, in fact, because this is freely available online. Just let me try to go to his website. So, the text, you're right, the textbook appears to be Real Analysis 1 by Paul Loya. And you can click on the chapter you want to find. And so, basically, what we have here are some, some propositions regarding continued fraction expansions in general. And ultimately, we're going to see some beautiful formulae. And as Loyo puts it, some of the most beautiful formulae in the world. And so, the first thing to consider here is basically a general continued fraction expansion, like I mentioned. Uh, and basically, what we can do is, the idea is that we can multiply the numerator and denominator of any continued fraction of this form. Uh, basically, we're going to multiply the numerator and denominator by the same number, some non-zero real number. So call it P0, for instance, as you can see on your left. Basically, we can multiply that to both the numerator, numerator and the denominator of any fraction whatsoever and preserve the value of that result, you know, because we're just multiplying by 1. And that's the general idea that we can form, that we can sort of... It's, it's the idea we can make use of, for instance, in order to get this particular result of continued fractions. And so this is a, what he calls a transformation rule, where basically we get a0, so in other words, any continued fr fraction expansion can be rewritten if we do this repeatedly, if we keep multiplying by, you know, p1 over p1, p2 over p2, we're just multiplying by 1 every time. So we can do this uh, kind of indefinitely. We can do this for as long as we'd like, and that preserves the value of the of the fraction, con or continued fraction. So, this is the result that we get. This is a somewhat basic result, but it will be used, or could be used, in, in future theorems. So it's something to make note of. So we get, in each of the numerators, p sub n minus 1 times p sub n times b sub n all over p sub n times a sub n, where n is greater than 1. Uh, and so that, yeah, that becomes the new kind of term in the continued fraction expansion. And so then it has two, uh, it says, we have this, this next section of the, of the textbook. So, two series and continued fraction identities. So, I just like you to look over this because it gets to be very, very interesting. We can take any subtraction, for instance, uh, of 1 over alpha 1 minus 1 over alpha 2, and we can rewrite that as a single, basically a single term, which is 1 over the quantity a1, a2 over a2 minus a1 as you can see right here. And so I, I encourage you to look through some of this. Maybe even just pause the video and, and take a look at these proofs, because they're, they're pretty algebraic proofs. They're, they're sort of relatively simple, in other words. 
Um, and the general idea is that we're simply rewriting any subtraction. It's basically uh, yeah, any subtraction of two fractions uh, as basically one single general continued fraction. So we have 1 over a1 minus 1 over a2 being equal to 1 over the quantity a1 plus a1 squared over a2 minus a1. That's this result right here. And the exercise, Loya says, uh, suggests the following theorem. So it's a more general theorem. This actually uses uh, basically an alternating sequence of fractions where we have positive, negative, positive, negative, in other words, for some natural number n. And it suggests this, this more general, uh, it's a larger structure, and a, kind of a more complex continued fraction. And basically, what we can do is we can extend this to make n approach infinity, as Loya mentions, and of course we can, we can generalize this result in order to get a, an infinite continued fraction expansion that approximates, or in other words, yeah, approximates the um, the overall sum to which an infinite sum converges, or the 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 value to which an infinite sum converges, if we can ascribe a, a value to it. So, assuming we have an alternating convergent sum, even if it's an infinite sum, we can still, uh, you know, assign a certain value to it, and that can be approximated with this very beautiful, very elegant continued fraction uh, on the right-hand side. And we can see the proof for this as well. And so, the proof that Loyal uses uh, happens to use induction, actually, which is a very very powerful kind of uh, principle in mathematics. Basically, what we're doing is we assume it works for a certain very specific value of n. For instance, n equals 1 terms. Well, this is, this is r quite rather intuitive if n equals 1, because then there's only one term for alpha, or, or alpha sub k, or a sub k, uh, namely a sub 1. <laughs> so in that particular case, we just get the sum being equal to 1 over a 1. And so, you know, b both sides of the equation give you that result, so obviously they're equal. Uh, and so we assume it's true for sums with n terms, for some number n, and we know it's true for one term. For, for n equals 1, that's our base case. We assume it's true for sums... We assume it's true for sums with n terms, and we're going to prove, Loya proves, that it holds for sums with n plus 1 terms. So first, uh, he says, observe that we can write this total sum of n plus 1 terms, and so basically what he does is, he uses specifically the last two terms, and does a, some some rather brilliant kind of uh, manipulations with them, and so you can you can see what he does. He factors out a uh, negative 1 to the n minus 1, and then he employs the the, f the first kind of lemma that, that uh, I addressed in this video, which is to say, basically, what is the simplified, what is the, um, what is another way of writing 1 over a minus 1 over b, where a and b are natural numbers. Well, he makes use of that, and so he, he gives us this, this formula from the second line to the third line here. And also, he, he uses another lemma that we mentioned, so, uh, well, basically, he's, yeah, he, he's doing that to get the very last line of this page, in fact. So it's 1 over a sub n, a sub n plus 1, all over a sub n plus 1 minus a sub n. Again, it's a nested fraction, so I feel like when I say it out loud, it, it, it implies some ambiguity, so I, I, I certainly hope you're, you're paying attention, but, but that, that's the result that we get, and I'm, I'm sure you are. So, uh, moving on from that, we actually end up with the sum of n terms, as Loya addresses, and so we can apply the induction hypothesis from there to, to already just conclude right off the bat that the formula works, in other words, because we manipulate basically the sum of n plus 1 terms to, and we show it to be equal to some kind of sum of n terms. And that's the whole idea of induction. We're taking a 
a marginally larger problem and sort of showing its relationship to the smaller case. And we assume it works for the smaller case uh, because we know we have a base case, n equals 1, of course. And so that kind of uh, almost has what I call kind of like a domino effect. So basically, we and this works for all for any induction proof. We know it works for a base case, and we know that if it works for n terms, it'll work for n plus 1 terms. So that kind of, you know, takes care of all natural numbers, theoretically, because we get this whole domino effect, where if it works for one term, it has to work for two terms. And if it works for two terms, it has to work for three terms, you know. That's the whole idea of induction. But anyways, I'm kind of, uh, well, uh, but I digress, I, I suppose. So what we can do is, uh... oh, also, there's a very key, very, um, I, I find this to be a very novel development. Right in the middle of the page here, he says, since a n times a sub n plus 1 all over a sub n plus 1 minus a sub n minus a sub n minus 1 equals, and he does this clever manipulation where basically he, um, he actually introduces other variables, like he says um, we can say that this is equal to a sub n times the quantity of a sub n plus 1 minus a sub n in parentheses. So he, he sort of manipulates it and gives it this this whole quantity. And then we're also tacking on a plus a sub n squared, because we, we have to do that in order to preserve the value of this fraction. And that's all over a sub n plus 1 minus a sub n. And, of course, we still get the minus a sub n minus 1 right up there uh, to the right of it. And so, basically, we can we can set this equal to and, and show that this is equal just by, uh, basically, algebraic manipulation to a sub n minus a sub n minus 1 plus a sub n squared over a sub n plus 1 minus a sub n. So we get this this rather brilliant, I, I find this to be a, a, a really quite novel kind of manipulation up there, uh, even if it's just an algebraic manipulation, because we can use this, as he mentions, of course, we, we uh, kind of substitute this into equation 7.7. And so this term that we had above, somewhat of a, you might say, a more messy term, a sub n times a sub n plus 1 all over a sub n plus 1 minus a sub n, that whole quantity in parentheses, we can show that to be equal to something much more elegant, which is on the right side here, uh, starting right, yeah, right to the right of this equal sign. It's a sub n minus a sub n minus 1 plus a sub n squared over a sub n plus 1 minus a sub n. So this is sort of refurnishing it. It's kind of uh, showing it to have a special equivalence, in other words. And specifically, it has this a sub n squared in it, which makes it a little bit more elegant, at least in my opinion, because we can see this uh, this pattern is continued, even for the nth value, basically even for the nth term, so to speak. So the, the end result we get, even if you weren't following all that, I, I hope you were, but this is a very interesting result. This is something you can uh, sort of impress your friends with, I think. And so if you substitute it into 7.7, .7, the net result is we get an arbitrary, you know, this is just, the left-hand side is just what we started with. It's basically the the thing that is an alternating sequence of arbitrary, it's a, n plus 1 terms, basically. And we know that the formula still holds, which is to say that it's it converges to 1 over a sub 1 plus a sub 1 squared over a2 minus a1 plus, et cetera, et cetera, and going all the way until we get to a sub n, uh, a sub n minus 1 squared over a sub n minus a sub n minus 1 plus a sub n squared over a sub n plus 1 minus a sub n. So it, it continues to follow this pattern, in other words, no matter how many terms you have. And as an example, what we can do is basically substitute because we happen to know, and I addressed this in my uh, Logarithm natu Naturalis video, uh, I, I might remake that video someday, but basically, we do know for a fact, based on, there are, there are some proofs of this, most of them use calculus of some sort, but the log of 2, the natural logarithm of 2, one of my favorite numbers of all time, 
is um it happens to be representable as this sum one minus one half plus one third minus one fourth plus one fifth minus a sixth plus one seventh etc etc et and if we use in other words this is a true statement we know this from calculus so what we can do is basically set a sub k in general in this more general formula to be equal to k where k is just some natural number and we can substitute that into our general formula to get this very interesting result so this is in fact equal to 1 over 1 plus 1 squared over 1 plus 2 squared over 1 plus 3 squared over 1 plus 4 squared because in other words every single time we see let me let me show you a good representation of that in other words in this center like central equation right there we have in the numerators it's always a sub i squared we have some yeah some a sub i squared and if a sub i is equal to i which is what we just said is true for the log of 2 in other words then we can substitute that and we get 1 squared 2 squared 3 squared etc etc all the way and it's an infinite series at least in theory so we can we can keep doing that indefinitely and so the numerators are just the squared and the, in other words the squared natural numbers the squares and what we have on the left so to speak well it's, it's the right it's still the right hand side but basically we also have this a sub 1 this a sub 2 minus a sub 1 a sub 3 minus a sub 2 basically we keep getting a result of 1 being added to those denominators so it's 1 plus 1 squared over 1 plus 2 squared over 1 plus etc etc that's just I wanted to make that explicit that all we're doing is substituting i for a sub i in that equation right there it's very interesting so that's our first kind of beautiful you know natural number result which is that this amazing complicated uh well it's 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 maybe perhaps a little bit complicated but arguably it's actually simple relative to other uh continued fraction structures i'm just saying it's an infinite continued fraction that has a very beautiful property a very uh interesting pattern and if we evaluate it if we were to take you know nth convergence for instance rational convergence of this continued fraction uh, expansion it converges to the natural log of two and that's amazing yeah so to be honest i'm probably going to split this up into multiple videos because i have i have a few more words to say obviously and so uh i might i might delay the uh proof of the irrationality of pi to part you know six seven perhaps part eight whatever it might be just uh just please be patient and uh Again, thanks for watching. So I'll probably continue this in part um, part six, actually, because uh, well, yeah. But thanks very much for watching, and that that just about covers it. So um, thanks.